Hello. Good evening. I am so glad that you joined us uh, for this most important webinar on genetics and genomics. Um, Kidney Cancer Canada has been anxious to have our, our speaker this evening, Dr. Raymond Kim, uh, through the Princess Margaret uh, Centre in Toronto. Uh, so I think this will be jam-packed with information that's very current. I think genetics and genomics are becoming more and more um, integrated into kidney cancer diagnosis and treatment. Um, I just want to introduce for a second Dr. Raymond Kim. He received his MD PhD from the University of Toronto with Dr. Tak W. Mack, who in, was uh, quite prominent in medical biophysics. He then completed his residency in internal, internal medicine, followed by a fellowship in medical genetics at the Hospital of Sick Children. His clinical interests lie in the transition of care, complex multidisciplinary care, and the adult hereditary disorders. His research incorporates novel genomic technologies in clinical care, including the whole genome sequencing and circulating DNA. He is medical director of cancer early detection, and I'm going to mess this up, but the Balwani Familial Cancer Clinic at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. He is also the PI of the Ontario Hereditary Cancer Research Network at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research and Provincial Head of the Provincial Genetics Program at Ontario Health. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Kim speak with us this evening and um, we'll uh, get started right into the recording. And thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learn lots. I'll see you at the end of the web, of the speech. Thank you. Presentation. Thanks. Uh, so thank you, uh, Christine, for inviting me and uh, delightful to see uh, the kidney cancer community. Uh, this is where I actually started my interest in uh, cancer genetics, um, uh, mentored by the great Mike Jewett, who got my interest in von Hippel Lindau disease. So I am uh, Raymond Kim. I'm a medical geneticist. And I work in uh, Toronto, and I'm here to share with you uh, some kidney cancer genetics, and I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. So first, I'd like to share uh, some fundamental concepts that uh, cancer is caused by genetic changes. And those genetic changes usually occur in a normal cell, and they can be caused by a number of different things. And what happens with those genetic changes, the, the, the cell... Uh, develops a abnormal growth pattern and starts to grow uncontrollably, and that's what's called the tumor. And then sometimes they grow so uncontrollably, they start to move throughout the body, and those are called metastases. Now, cancer cells can acquire these genetic changes uh, in a variety of different ways, such as the environment. And uh, this is a picture taken from the NIH uh, describing how UV radiations, chemicals, smoking, and viruses and other uh, environmental insults can cause uh, cancer. Um, and sometimes these genetic changes can be inherited or in uh, what we call hereditary cancer or uh, germline genetic cancer. And that's the space that I uh, work in. So there's lots of different types of concepts in cancer genetics as a whole. And there are genetic events that occur exclusively in the tumor, meaning that they are somatic or acquired after birth. And those genetic changes or mutations, what we call them, or variants, genetic variants, um, contribute to genetic events that are localized in the tumor. And these are uh, things that are known as cancer driver mutations, chromosomal changes, mutational processes, and they contribute to the um, cancer therapy uh, strategies, such as creating antigens, which immunotherapy uses, um, and they also create tumor heterogeneity, meaning that the tumor has a mixture of different types of genetic changes. Now, in the germline, and it's called the germline because it's the inherited genetic material, and the germline you can pass on to your children, and that's the egg and the sperm, uh, the genetic events in the germline contribute to drug metabolism, they contribute to human leukocyte antigens, which are responsible for bone marrow transplantation. Um, and then I deal with familial risk or inherited types of cancer. 
So <clears throat> lots of different types of genetic changes that contribute to cancer as a whole. Now, how these genetic changes are actually analyzed is becoming very, very complex. When I first started working with uh, Kidney Cancer Canada, it was fairly straightforward. Um, and, you know, the genetic tests that were available for a kidney cancer patient were rather limited. But now, depending on what you analyze the genetic material, the implications are very, very different. So I'll start with the tumor. The tumor is the uh, uh, kidney cancer, which origi originates inside the body. Usually you get a biopsy or it's taken out. And you can analyze that directly by looking at the genetic events that contributed to that uh, uh, cancer. Now, to figure out which of these genetic events are actually acquired throughout the life or you're actually born with, you need to look at the blood or the genetic material in the blood, which is known as the germline, or is your inherited genetic material, which is you inherited 50% from your biologic uh, father and 50% from your biologic uh, mother. Um, in those types of genetic analysis, we usually use the blood as the genetic material, which is representative of the DNA that you were born with. But even the blood is becoming a little bit complicated because as you age, you develop these genetic changes in the blood that may not be may not have been there in when you were born. And in the most severe context, some people develop leukemia. And so the blood is becoming a, a little bit of an unusual uh, uh, tissue to analyze, and it's not as straightforward as, as it was before. And furthermore, cell-free DNA is detectable because this is the uh, genetic technologies are so sophisticated, they can pick up small fragments of DNA that are released into the blood from a lot of different cells that are dying in the body. Another tissue I often use, particularly in those patients where blood is not an appropriate tissue, such as those patients who develop these acquired genetic changes in their blood cells throughout life, or a leukemia patient who also happens to have kidney cancer, we use a different uh, tissue to analyze their inherited genetic material, and that is the skin, because presumably the skin ha doesn't have that many uh, genetic changes, and if you do it deep enough, the fibroblasts are representative of the inherited genetic material. So in summary, this busy slide uh, articulates that depending on where you take the DNA, the message and the information is a little bit different. And I want to walk through all of those uh, uh, very slowly for you. So I'll focus on, firstly on tumor genetic events. So tumor genetic events, the oncologist usually uses it to determine what types of chemotherapy to give you. Because when you look at the tumor, if you see a certain type of genetic event that contributed to that tumor, there's potentially a drug that we can match to it. Irrespective of where that genetic change occurred, it is definitely in your tumor. And if we can target that mutation in the tumor, I want to give you a drug. So and there's lots of clinical trials and lots of different types of drugs that are currently available for these types of uh, genetic changes. And usually the genes that the oncologists were interested in and available in the uh, clinical trials and, and precision cancer therapies didn't overlap with many of the inherited genes. But now we are seeing that there is a fusion of these uh, uh, types of genetic uh, um, genes um, that have precision cancer therapies, which is resulting in the inherited cancer uh, genetics and the tumor cancer genetics fields to kind of come together. Interestingly, about 8% of advanced cancers have an inherited component, and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in the next few slides. So what are inherited genetic changes? As the most famous person, uh, uh, they are very common, um, and there are some famous people out there that have genetic changes. The, uh, the most uh, well-known is the BRCA gene. The BRCA gene causes hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So the Osborne family has a BRCA1 variant, Matthew Knowles, who's Beyonce's dad, has a BRCA2 variant, so that increases his risk of prostate cancer and male breast cancer. 
Uh, Camille Grammer has Lynch syndrome, which is known uh, for causing uh, hereditary colorectal and endometrial cancer. And local uh, uh, media moguls, Libby Zenaber has a BRCA2 variant. And here she is seen with our pancreatic surgeon, uh, Dr. Steve Gallinger. Now, this is mainly hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, which takes the lion's share of all the press. However, these principles um, are extended to inherited forms of kidney cancer. Now, what does this mean? So inherited forms of cancer, you're born with this genetic change. And these patients we call as previvors. They have a genetic change that they were born with. They don't have cancer. And depending on the genetic change, we uh, prescribe uh, specific surveillance for these patients to detect their cancers early. And depending on the gene, there are over 100 different genes that cause inherited forms of cancer. At least a dozen of them cause inherited forms of kidney cancer. They undergo surveillance very early on in life. Sometimes, invariably, many of them um, get uh, afflicted with cancer. They undergo cancer treatment, often targeted towards their inherited genetic event. They survive that cancer. But because that genetic change is in their whole body, they may get another cancer uh, uh, very shortly thereafter. So this cycle continues. So there's a lot of myths in genetic testing that I want to dispel today. The first myth is, is that genetic patients will face uh, discrimination. Um, almost 10 years ago, there was a, a bill called S201. That was the Genetics Non-Discrimination Act. And this ensures that in Canada, where we have universal health care and we cannot be discriminated based on our genetic uh, information for health care, that, that um, vendors of goods and services such as life insurance and disability insurance and other insurance uh, cannot ask you about your uh, genetic status and nor can your employer. So that is now law in Canada and has been... Uh, uh, um, has been upheld, even though some provinces tried to appeal this. Another myth is uh, my children will carry my genes. While it is true that uh, inherited forms of cancer have a 50% risk of being passed down to uh, uh, offspring, for decades, if we identify this genetic change very early, we can engineer embryos so that genetic change doesn't get passed down to the subsequent uh, generation. Another myth is that uh, patients must pay for genetic testing. By and large, at least in Ontario, if you fit certain criteria, most uh, patients uh, can get genetic testing. It used to cost about $1,000 a gene, and now it can be as low as $100, uh, sorry, a dollar a gene. And most clinical panels cost uh, under $1,000 and encompass uh, dozens of genes. And before, uh, genetic conditions were considered taboo, but now uh, awareness is increasing, mainly due to a lot of advocacy and press that uh, is known as the Angelina Jolie effect, where uh, she harbors a BRCA1 uh, genetic change and really brought awareness to inherited forms of cancer. So some general principles. Who should get genetic testing? And there's a referral guidance for hereditary cancer genetic assessment at Ontario Health, which is on their website. Core principle is start with someone who has cancer. We like to do the genetic chain, the genetic testing for inherited types of cancer on the family member who has cancer so we can match the genetic testing result to the actual cancer phenotype. Now, sometimes if there's a strong family history of cancer, healthy family members may get genetic testing, but the family history has to be quite strong to reach a certain pretest probability to make genetic testing worthwhile and cost effective. But at the same time, that family member who doesn't have cancer may not have inherited the gene because they are cancer free. So that's why testing a family member who doesn't have cancer is less useful. So we look for patients who have a strong family history of cancer, young patients with uh, cancer, usually 10 years earlier than the average diagnosis of that cancer. Multiple cancers in the same individual, such as kidney cancer, brain cancer, or uh, uh, kidney cancer and pheochromocytoma. 
and also rare tumors. Uh, some that are listed here all get genetic testing. And uh, we have, at least in Ontario, uh, a very state-of-the-art uh, genetic testing program, which was updated in 2021. So in 2021, it used to be only breast and colon cancer, but thankfully, now hereditary renal tumor syndromes are on this uh, list. <clears throat> Before only one lab did it, when I came to Kidney Cancer Canada over a decade, almost a decade ago. And now we have nine provincial funded labs. And the testing is paid for by the government. And the threshold to trigger testing used to be a pretest probability of 10%, which was a little bit high. And now we've lowered that to, to, to 5%. So in hereditary kidney cancer, who is going to get tested? So if there is one of the following criteria, then we suspect that there is an inherited form bilateral multifocal disease, meaning that you have kidney cancer in both, can in both kidneys, or if one, one kidney has a lot of different cancers, um, that would be suggestive that you did not just have a acquired genetic event localized somewhere in a small region of your kidney, but you were actually born with a genetic change that puts your whole kidney and body at risk. Certainly, when you are younger, because you were born with that genetic change, you may have an inherited form. And the threshold we use is 45 for any kidney cancer. If there is a close relative, uh, a sibling, a parent, or a child who also has kidney cancer, that makes us also in, uh, suspicious of an inherited uh, uh, source. Non-clear cell. So clear cell is the most common form of kidney cancer. If it's non-clear cell, such as papillary, chromophobic, oncocytic hybrid tumors, then we are suspicious of an inherited form. If there is a syndromic presentation in seizures and pneumothorax or other sorts of types of, of um, tumors associated with certain types of disorders, which I will go over, then we start thinking of an inherited form of kidney cancer. And other associated tumors with these um, syndromic types of kidney cancer, and I'll go over them. These are the genes we test for. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, at least 15 genes. Um, the gene list doesn't seem to be growing in the kidney cancer literature, but certainly over time, Ontario Health uh, is reviewing these lists all the time to see if any new genes get added. So I work with a lot of genetic counselors who deliver genetic testing. They are master's degrees professionals who are exquisitely trained to educate uh, patients on how genetic testing um, uh, works and what the different types of results mean for them and their family. So at Princess Margaret, uh, we used to have a traditional pathway when we were focusing on breast and ovarian cancer. So if a person had a breast cancer diagnosis, we would, uh, the oncologist would discuss genetic testing and send the referral. They would have to wait for the genetic uh, appointment. They would, we would arrange genetic testing results and then get that result. And then we would um, um, make medical recommendations based on that. But that could take months. And, and at that time, genetic testing was quite expensive. Uh, but now that genetic testing has decreased in price and is not a um, healthcare resource we need to gatekeep, we're doing something that's called mainstreaming where the oncologists order genetic testing up front. It's a simple blood test. We get the genetic testing result, and then the oncologist also gets the genetic testing result, and then we personalize uh, the, the uh, on oncology care based on the mutation status. Now, this has been very well uh, documented in the breast and ovarian cancer uh, field, and we're beginning to do this in the kidney cancer space, where when you see your kidney cancer specialist, they can actually order genetic testing. But in order to do this and expand the scope of our oncology colleagues, whether it be your surgical oncologist, your medical oncologist, or radiation oncologist, there needs to be some education about this because you know most surgeons and, and medical oncologists didn't go to genetic counseling school. 
and might need some fundamental uh, uh, informed consent principles to discuss uh, genetic testing with their patients. But it's not uh, a very complicated type of process, and it is just a blood test. And then also, depending on the results, because genetic testing results can be quite complicated, the genetics team needs to be involved in reviewing a lot of these results to make sure that the appropriate test was ordered, the right genes were ordered, and the right result is delivered to the patient. Because if it's negative, a lot of the times it doesn't mean much to the patient and their family. But if there's a genetic change, then the genetics team needs to be involved. So a little bit of data is that for a year, uh, um, hereditary uh, ca cancer testing was rolled out in Ontario. There was about 10,000 tests completed in the province. More than two-thirds of them were for breast cancer. Less than 2% of these tests were for kidney cancer, meaning that it's underutilized. And we are seeing this also in the American context where depending on the type of kidney cancer, the number of patients that met the criteria for genetic testing, only a third of them or a quarter of them actually got genetic testing, meaning that 65 to 75% of patients do not have testing, meaning that their family members could be at risk too. It's not like we don't know what to do with these uh, hereditary cancer syndromes either. Bravon Hippolindau, hereditary papillary renal cell carcinoma, hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma, bert hogg um, a succinate dehydrogenase, tuber sclerosis complex. We have very good guidelines on how to manage these patients and take care of them so they can live longer and, and uh, we can detect their cancer early. So I'm going to talk about each of these syndromes. The first is hereditary papillary renal cell carcinoma. This is due to a genetic change in the MET gene. And these patients have kidney cancer that are papillary type 1. And these are the families that were first uh, described by Marston Linehan when he first discovered this gene. And there is abdominal imaging that is implemented very early uh, in these patients and detects the cancer early also. But thankfully, these tumors grow very slowly. And then over time, it seems that the cancer risk kind of decreases as uh, people get a little bit older. Now, other types of hereditary cancers in papillary type 2 occur, and that is uh, hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma. It's a mouthful. It's called HLRCC for short. It is caused by the fumarate hydratase gene. In young women, interestingly, it causes fibroids and fibroids in their 20s and 30s. So if there's a family history of fibroids in very young women and a history of kidney cancer, particularly the papillary type 2 cancer, then we would consider this gene for genetic testing. And these patients also need um, intensive surveillance with abdominal imaging. Their fibroids can be quite symptomatic. They don't usually result in uh, uh, uterine cancer. And then interestingly, fumarate hydratase, if you have two partners, two people who have HLRCC and they have a child, that child can develop a severe metabolic disorder known as fumarate hydratase deficiency if they inherit the genetic change from both of their parents if their parents are uh, a, uh, HLRCC carriers. So just a little bit of a tidbit of why genetic counseling is important for family planning. So bert hogg dubé is a syndrome that results in chromophobic oncocytic or oncocytic hybrid tumors and is caused by a gene known as FLCN or folliculin. We see little bumps on these patients' faces. They also develop cysts in their lungs and often these cysts can rupture, causing what we call a pneumothorax. So if there's a family history of pneumothorax, chromophobic kidney cancer, then we think Berthog dubé and folliculin testing is often ordered. And these patients require abdominal imaging. They also often need to see a respirologist for uh, CT scans of their chest and pulmonary function tests to see if they are at risk of developing any pneumothoraces or any other intervention for their cysts in their lungs. One of my favorite syndromes is known as von Hippel-Lindau syndrome. 
So these patients are at risk of developing clear cell carcinoma, uh, kidney cancer, and it's a multi-system disorder from the head down to uh, the kidneys and even the testes. Um, these patients develop blood vessels in their brains known as hemangioblastomas. Uh, they develop cysts in their ears, their pancreas. They develop kidney cancer, clear cell. They develop pheochromocytoma also. And interestingly, uh, they now have a precision cancer therapy known as belzutifan. So belzutifan is a HIF2 alpha inhibitor that was discovered by studying von Hippel-Lindau patients and understanding that pathway. And that pathway actually uh, won a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, and mainly due to this uh, uh, drugs discovery that is changing the lives of VHL patients everywhere. So truly a personalized medicine uh, 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 success story. And uh, um, hopefully this could be extended to all inherited forms of cancer. Now, succinate dehydrogenase is a uh, family of genes that are involved in the mitochondria and are involved in um, oxidation and, 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 and uh, oxidative stress inside uh, of the cell. And there's various subunits known as succinate dehydrogenase A, B, C, and AF2. And these contribute and have a increased propensity to develop pheochromocytoma. So pheochromocytoma are adrenal gland tumors, but they also develop renal cell carcinoma, usually the clear cell type. Another uh, kidney cancer uh, syndrome is known as um, tuberous sclerosis complex. This is also like von Hippel-Lindau, a multi-systemic disorder where patients develop cutaneous findings, uh, angiomyolipomas in the kidney that can develop into kidney cancer, they also develop a certain type of cyst in the lung known as lymphangiomyomatosis. They get uh, 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 growths around their uh, nails, and they can have seizures and brain tumors and a host of other medical problems. But not everybody with tuberous sclerosis has all of these problems. Now, this disorder is also a success story when it comes to uh, treating uh, uh, inherited types of cancers, where by studying this pathway, scientists were able to understand how to modulate it or regulate it to treat the kidney cancers or the, or the manifestations of this disorder. So tuber tuberous sclerosis is caused by two genes, TSC1 and TSC2, and TSC1 and TSC2 encode two proteins known as tuberin and hamartin. And those proteins are involved in what's called the mTOR pathway. And when you lose these two proteins or one of these two proteins, this pathway is on overdrive, causing the cell to grow rather quickly. So by inhibiting this pathway with a drug known as Everolimus, we could potentially limit the growth of these tumors. And that's been shown in the angiomyolipomas or the kidney masses in these patients and also the brain masses in these patients. So truly another personalized medicine success story on hereditary cancer patients. Now I summarize these. I uh, used to work with a student who put this all together and we distributed this uh, across our uh, clinical network on how to remember all these genetic changes and the syndromes and all of that. And it was uh, well received. And uh, certainly I can share this with this uh, uh, audience here also. Now I'm going to, you know, use the last 10 minutes or so to talk a little bit about some emerging cancer genetics concepts. So I talked to you that using the blood is a little bit uh, um, unusual in that the Buffy coat or the white blood cells is what we use to infer the genetic material you were born with. The tumor, we analyze for the genetic changes that occur in the tumor, which, which encompass both the ones that you acquired through your life that contributed to that tumor, and then also the genetic changes that potentially contributed to that tumor too. Sometimes we need to use skin fibroblasts to look at the inherited genetic uh, changes, especially in patients who have leukemia. Now, interestingly, there's a new uh, 
uh, entity that's known as cell-free DNA. So what is cell-free DNA? I talked to you a little bit about what the white blood cell DNA is, but cell-free DNA is actually DNA that is released from cells that are dying in the body. And these cells can occur in different types of contexts. The cells in the body grow and die all the time. In the gut, your hair cells, your mouth, your mucosal cells in the mouth, they're always constantly turning over. Stem cells in the body regenerate, and cells, when they reach a certain age, start to die and they need to be cleared. And part of that clearance results in DNA that's released from that cell and shed, and that's called cell-free DNA because they've been released from the cell with all the other cells' contents. So it occurs in inflammatory states. It occurs in pregnant women where the fetus's a placenta is shedding that fetus's DNA into the blood. And then also uh, it occurs in cancer patients where cancer cells release that DNA into the blood. So this is what's called a liquid biopsy or cell-free DNA analysis. So liquid biopsy is cell-free DNA analysis in the cancer context. So what do you expect the cell-free DNA to look like in a cancer patient? Usually the cell-free DNA in a healthy person should be quite low, like it is here. And then cell-free DNA starts to go up when you start developing cancer because your cancer cell starts to grow, divide, die, and release the cell-free DNA. And then when you go undergo therapy, it should decrease. But then over time, everybody who has uh, a cancer knows that they need surveillance scans to make sure it doesn't recur. And what we would suspect over time, when you start developing a cancer recurrence, that cell-free DNA goes up again. All right? So we hope and we think that liquid biopsy, by doing this blood test on cell-free DNA, is going to be able to help guide our oncologist on what's happening inside your body in addition to the scans you get uh, every three to six months or even longer, depending on how far you are from your cancer. So that's liquid biopsy. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the research that I am involved in, because as you know, I am part of the inherited or familial types of cancer uh, community. So these are these syndromes are actually quite rare. They occur in about 1 in 20,000 to 200,000 individuals. And because families are spread across the province, they don't visit one hospital, it's hard to bring them under one umbrella, hard to do research on them, hard to enroll them in clinical trials, hard to innovate. So that's why uh, the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research got interested in how can we make the lives of those patients who have inherited forms of cancer, including that of kidney cancer, better. So just before COVID hit, we had this nice little think tank that resulted in all of these people agreeing to work together towards the common goal in making a hereditary cancer research network. And this is a $4.5 million project that is funded by the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research called the OHCRN, Ontario Hereditary Cancer Research Network. And our objective is to identify every single cancer, inherited cancer patient in the province, populate it with key data points, engage the community and enable research and enrollment into clinical trials, early cancer detection uh, programs such as liquid biopsy and imaging, and then um, uh, really do some novel uh, discovery so we can improve the lives of all inherited forms of cancer. And we know that if we improve the lives of inherited forms of cancer, those lessons extend to those non-inherited forms of cancer because there is so much overlaps and lessons learned. So there are a lot of initiatives going on in Ontario, but they don't focus on hereditary kidney cancer, such as breast cancer, GI cancer, kids cancers, and uh, ovarian cancer. And that's why be we believe that the Ontario Hereditary Cancer Research will fill a void for all inherited forms of cancer uh, in the province. And these stakeholders are all involved in this big project and we hope can unify all of them, which were either 
uh, which otherwise were working in isolation. These are the committees. Uh, we have a steering committee, we have a database management subcommittee, we have a lab committee and a research uh, subcommittee. And I want to thank all of these uh, uh, um, generous um, scientists, researchers, clinicians, and patient partners who are involved in this uh, big, big project. So finally, I'd like to thank my team at the Princess Margaret. They are here. It's a small but powerful team that is involved in uh, all the research that I do and helped uh, generate some of the uh, slides I shared today. So with that, I will take any questions. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for this very informative webinar and for joining us for the uh, question and answer um, session. I know that I have a list um, that has come through by email and joining us also is Mona Awad, who is our French liaison. So she's handling any uh, French questions that are coming our way. Um, thank you so much because we've been waiting a long time to get the genetics and genomics. We think it's a very important part of kidney cancer. And I think we'll just jump right into some of the questions. I know that you did answer um, some in your talk, but just in case, we'll kind of throw them at you um, as we go. So one that comes often to us um, from our patients in general are, you know, the you know, 23andMe kind of genetic testing. Um, people often ask us if that would be sufficient to identify anything um, that they may have in their genetic history. So could you just kind of elaborate on the difference between the kind of ge genetic uh, testing for 23andMe, you know, the kind that you order through the internet and, and the very scientific type of genetic testing? It's not recommended, is it, for patients? Medical grade uh, genetic testing is always done with your physician or uh, medical practitioners, such as a genetic counselor. Uh, and 23andMe uh, historically has not been uh, medical grade that we can use to you to make medical decisions. And if somebody comes in with a 23andMe report, usually it would not have medically relevant genetic changes. And these are small genetic changes known as polymorphisms mm -hmm. uh, that are common in the population and have some association with common diseases mm -hmm. that are not in the medical genetics field. So medical geneticists use genetic testing to find rare genetic changes that result mm -hmm. in severe medical conditions. Um, okay. and those are the mo those are the majority of the ones that I discussed today. That being mm -hmm. said, 23andMe has moved into the medically relevant genetic changes, but oh. only specific genetic changes that are relevant to certain ethnicities and mm -hmm. certain types of cancers, such as founder mutations in the BRCA gene in Ashkenazi Jewish patients, which are not really relevant for the kidney cancer population. Right. So I would not recommend 23andMe for any medical use whatsoever for a kidney cancer patient. It is more uh, uh, recreational type of genetics that may give you a little bit of information that you probably already knew, don't smoke, exercise, that type of uh, uh, lifestyle um, changes. And certainly uh, the BRCA genes are um, not highly relevant for a kidney cancer patient, unless of course you are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent then that may be something that you are interested in. But that being said, it should not be the first test that you go for. Uh, and that same thing for ancestry testing, they don't test for anything that's relevant for a physician to use. Okay. And then even if they come in with an Ashkenazi Jewish mutation, I usually retest them because it's not done in a medical setting where the blood is drawn with a bona fide technician and the identifiers match the sample. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, on the on this kind of the same theme is sometimes you know if patients feel that they're not necessarily you, you gave some guidelines in your talk that you know 
45 years and less um, being diagnosed or if there's a direct uh, relationship with a, a family member that, you know, close relationship that has a tumor already. But sometimes we get um, our patients asking and as you may know, there's lots of advertisements for, especially in the US that they can identify a lot of um, medical situations through, you know, your mail in type of um, testing, which is the same, but they ask if it's worthwhile for them, if they fall, don't fall into that category, say 45 years young or less, would it be worthwhile that, for them to go to a private clinic you know, since they don't qualify and they would pay for themselves. Are there medical um, grade labs that they can use across Canada in order to get the testing that might give them information? So that's an interesting question. In, in Canada, um, you know, I'm a little bit conflicted in this type of uh, question because I, I am a big believer in the Canadian healthcare system mm -hmm. where we do a good job and everybody who uh, receives medical care through the publicly funded system gets standard of care. And, and you know, being in, and this is compared to the capitalistic approach of the US where money buys you healthcare. Um, you know, that's not being said, that's not totally unheard of in the, in the uh, mm -hmm you know, Canadian healthcare system where you, know, you can pay a few hundred dollars and get a fiberglass cast versus a regular uh, plaster cast. Yes. Um, so is that, you know, two tiered healthcare? I don't know. Right. Um, but suffice to say that there is uh, guided genetic testing that is medical grade. I would, uh, if you are affected with kidney cancer, it has to be the right panel um, that you are paying out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to a private clinic um, and seek uh, their genetic services, which a lot of the times are medical grade, uh, okay. depending on the service. But at the same time, there is a danger that they are upselling you something that you do not need. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't fit into the categories that the ministry has or the, the provincial guidelines um, set forth, the probability of you having a genetic mutation is less than 5%. We okay. designed those guidelines to pick up people that are high risk. It's just like we can't scan everybody's brain. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't do mammograms under a certain age because it's not useful. It doesn't mean not cost effective. It doesn't mean that cancer doesn't exist in these people. And it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you could be that 5%. So if you're highly motivated and you are doing that, there are some genetic testing companies, mainly not in Canada, that you can mail your sample to. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, the most prominent genetic testing program that I am, that I am aware of in, in Canada is uh, what's known as the Screen Project at Women's College, which is primarily focused on breast cancer patients. Okay. But they do have a medical grade test that encompasses the kidney cancer genes. Okay. So if you don't fit into that criteria, you know, for two to three hundred dollars, you can pay for a genetic test that is medically guided under the auspices of a very good research team. Um, and I collaborate with them. So that may be my conflict of interest, but I do have my own opinions on their approach. So that okay. is one avenue. Um, now having genetic testing brokered through somebody that is not in Canada, I wonder if it's the appropriate test. And if it's a for profit company, I wonder if they are upselling you additional testing that may not be medically necessary. But without knowing that, it's hard to say what it is. In the end, I would ask your oncologist and present to them, is, is, is this appropriate for me? If they don't know, they may point you to a, a, a genetics team, which, mm -hmm. may be a which may be able to advise the... Uh, uh, oncologist, if they have a good relationship with them, 
that, yeah, this might be a test that is not recreational and 23andMe and, and will give some medically relevant information. Okay, great. And actually, you've answered one of the questions from our audience who asked if they should begin the question of genetic testing with their oncologist. So I'm understanding that's who they should speak to for genetic testing. Is that correct? Yeah, so the oncologist is is very much uh, um, the first person. It, particularly, you know, there's two camps you always have to think of for those people who fit this criteria is um, the patient who has cancer and those mm -hmm. relatives, the relatives of the people who do have kidney cancer and are worried about that if they have an inherited form of kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. The the basic principle in genetic testing is always start with the patient who has kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and they are the most informative patient for that genetic testing, because if there isn't a gene identified in that individual, it's very unlikely that that kidney cancer is inherited unless there are other family members that are affected. And depending on the degree of relationship of the patient or family member that doesn't have cancer, they may not inherit that genetic change. Mm -hmm. So the most valuable person, and I call them the lighthouse to the family, is the patient who has kidney cancer. They are the ones who need genetic testing. They should speak to their oncologist because they probably have an oncologist mm -hmm. uh, to talk to. Is my kidney cancer a rare histology? Am I young? Should I get genetic testing? And, and um Secondly, because the genetics clinics are so overwhelmed, the fourth question to ask is, can you order this genetic testing for me? And a lot of the times, at least in Ontario, you can order the genetic testing through the oncologist because we have that built out in many, many of the genetics clinics that operate in, in the Ontario network. Okay. So you don't have to wait for another subsequent appointment. Now, the family member going to their family doctor and saying, I don't have kidney cancer, but mom has kidney cancer. Can you order genetic testing? That's probably not a very effective route at all. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, of course, you have to think about, well, what if my the person with kidney cancer has passed away? Mm -hmm. What is the likelihood that they have uh, a gene? Um, then you have to look at the whole phenotype, right? Okay. If they have these, if it's very high risk, for example, mm -hmm. If a patient had kidney cancer and pheochromocytoma, I think of Von Hippel-Lindau, and they unfortunately passed away and their family members are seen, then I would have to look at it a little bit more closely. Okay. Uh, just because of an answer that you gave, and it ties in with a couple of questions from our audience, you mentioned a rare um, rare type, you know, subtype of kidney cancer, such as chrom. I'll use the example of chromophobe because I have a couple of questions in regard to chromophobe. Are they more recommended, that, that subtype of kidney cancer, would that be more recommended to have it is, genetic it is. testing? Yeah, so basically non-clear cell. Non-clear cell, if you don't have a clear cell, a lot of the times those histologies, like papillary type 2, papillary type 1, um, uh, chromophobic, oncocytic hybrids for bird hog dubé, uh, those are the ones that we are suspicious. Okay. Granted, the older you are, the, and the less features you have, like other features in your body, right. such as the skin or the uterus, etc., it's unlikely. But because kidney cancer genetics is so unknown, we've developed the criteria, at least in Ontario, to be all-encompassing. And to be quite honest, kidney cancer testing is underutilized compared to breast cancer testing. So mm -hmm. I would definitely support uh, people who had non-clear cell to have genetic testing considered. Okay. And what would be the recommended age? Say, for example, and just as generic, um, you know, there's a mom that has children, she has chromophobe, and she fe she's she been, um, you know, under treatment for, I'll say, 20 years. Um, and she did have, as you mentioned, so I didn't realize that like, fibroids, for example, was a, a factor. Um, what age should her children be considered for testing? Is it, would that be necessary or would she have the testing first? She always has to have the testing first. She needs okay. to have the testing first because usually with the kidney cancer patient, we like to test with a broad panel with multiple genes. And 
if we don't find anything in that person, there's nothing to test in the children. What okay. are we going to test for? We need okay. to find the familial, specific, genetic, private change to test the family. Okay. We don't, so genetic testing comes in different flavors. If you okay. want to test the family members, you need to have that private mutation identified. So it needs to be pre-identified in, in the person with the cancer. And then you would, if you can't identify it, then there's not really any reason to, for the children to be genetic. Yeah, there's no, like we can't, yeah. So in, in, you know, the counter argument is, well, why don't you test for all the genes in the child? That isn't very effective and the yield is actually very low um, mm -hmm. without having the a priori or the coming into the uh, decision of testing. If you have that private mutation, it's, it's much more efficient and much more effective than okay. just randomly, blindly trying to, you know, test as many people as possible. Right. Mona, do you have a question uh, for us? Um, uh, none in the French, from the French uh, audience, but I had a question when we talk about um, strong family history in, in, uh, of cancer. Does it need to be the same type of cancer? Or is it any cancer? There are certain patterns of cancer that are indicative of certain types of genes. And, and you know, in kidney cancer, there are a few that go together. Um, mm. For example, we'll use the breast cancer example, breast, ovary, prostate cluster together with pancreas. Uh, so when we see a family history, we're like, okay, this is a BRCA2 family. In kidney cancer for the genes, it's actually much more complicated. Um, if you think about if kidney cancer is clustering together in first degree relatives, now first degree relatives are those relatives who are siblings, children, and parents. If probably two siblings, a parent and a child have kidney cancer, smells a little bit fishy for us it's enough to recommend genetic testing now i'll contrast that to a kidney cancer in a, in a 50 year old and a breast cancer at the age of 60 in that patient's mother right it's not so suspicious because the genes don't go together not many breast cancer genes cause kidney cancer um, especially if the histology is clear cell and it's a little bit of an older age now, on the contrary, I can find you some other examples where a young lady has fibroids in her 20s and 30s and then comes in with a, you know, kidney cancer in her 30s. That is a little bit more suspicious of HLRCC or hereditary leiomyelitosis and renal cell carcinoma, and especially if it's a papillary subtype, then we get a little bit more worried. If kidney cancer and pheochromocytoma, definitely a big, big red flag. Those are the ones that kind of go together. A patient who has a kidney cancer and a lung rupture, that is uh, uh, called a pneumothorax, that is also suspicious of a hereditary form. So, you know, and then if it's common cancers, such as colon, cervical, breast, mm -hmm. lung, in a family, at older ages, in people who smoke, probably not that interesting. Young kidney cancer, related types of cancers um, in a close relationship, that's a little bit more suspicious. I don't know if that helps because in kidney cancer, I, it, it is a little bit more nuanced. Okay. Um, I have had a question from the audience that if they had previously a genetic testing, have there been advances in genetic testing that would be more definitive? And should they, in, um, you know, investigate it again? Say that again? So say, for example, um, they were first diagnosed in year, a few years ago or maybe five or more years ago, they've had genetic testing done yes. in regard yes. to their kidney cancer. Yes. Have there been ch um, changes in the genetic tests that are being done so that they should revisit having t testing done again? So five years ago, the genetic testing, depending on what they had, hasn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. But in the genetics clinic, we usually tell them to get in touch with us every five years or so, okay. just to have a look and say, is there a new gene? 
have I had any, do I need updated testing? And generally it's, it's a no, but in most cases, mm -hmm. if it's seven to eight years ago, they probably need an update. Um, and simply because if you were tested once and you weren't mm -hmm. found to have a mutation, it doesn't mean if you're tested with updated technology and it's looking a little bit deeper, they won't, they may find one. So it's always good to keep that genetic testing report, ask the doctor, do I need to do it again? And then they may say, no, you got pretty good, sophisticated genetic testing. You don't need another one. Um, you know, you can check in with us a little bit later. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, some of our questions are very patient oriented and I'm trying to kind of generalize them because um, just for our audience, we, we don't ask patient specific questions. So I will try to generalize as, as much as possible. So um, for example, if a patient had um, a subtype and uh, their mother also had other cancers, um, should they both, and like the one patient had a subtype of kidney cancer, the mom had other types of cancers, should they both have uh, testing done or should we focus on the mom or, I know you've kind of answered that it question. Depends but... on, it, it depends on the situation. The, the most informative person is the person who has the rarest type of cancer Okay. at the youngest age. So okay. I don't know what type of cancer the mother had. I don't know what yeah. cancer that this patient had. But th those are the things that we weigh. Who to test first. If they're totally unrelated and a little bit on the older side, yes. then we probably wouldn't test either of them. Okay. Um, so it requires a little bit of uh, understanding of the pattern of the okay. family. Okay. A patient zero does test positive for... Um, uh, genetic disorder. Uh, what? When would you start testing children? Depends on the gene. Some of the genes are adult onset, mm -hmm. and we test when they are of seventeen to eighteen years of age. Okay. There's no minimum age in 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 uh, Canada for informed consent for genetic testing, but we usually okay. reserve the adult onset conditions for adulthood. But some of these conditions affect very young childhood, and we would test the children because at young ages, it depends on the gene, right? Okay. VHL, we test very young. Um, within the first decade of life, we would want to test von Um And other, and, and the same thing with tuberous sclerosis or other syndromic types. But other mm -hmm. genes, we test uh, uh, a, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the gene. Each gene has a age of onset. Okay. Um, this is a little bit change in, in, um, t in the questioning, but as you well are aware that across Canada, you know, with remote and rural patients, they don't necessarily have access to, um, you know, genetic testing and, and they, that sort of thing. Are, is it possible to go from province to another province where they would have access to genetic testing? Are you aware of that or are there yes, processes it, it, they have to follow? So unfortunately, our Canadian healthcare system is regionalized in provinces. You right. all pay taxes to your province and that is the healthcare system that you receive for those taxes. Um, so that is why you are beholden to have those services. Now, if you physically come to a different province, then you are like the Canadian Healthcare Act says that your healthcare is portable. So you can, uh, if you move to Ontario or seek medical care in Ontario and you're physically here, then you are under the uh, umbrella of the Ontario healthcare system using your non Ontario uh, uh, health card. Um, but I can't practice in, you know, some of the questions I tried to answer, but I couldn't, but I can't practice in New Brunswick. I don't mm -hmm. have a medical license in New Brunswick. Of course. My, my, and so I cannot see patients that are physically in New Brunswick unless right. I go there. Um, so 
There are other mechanisms to use, such as research-based studies. The, the screen project is uh, national. Um, there are other things, but unfortunately, the genetic system isn't perfect. And mm -hmm. fortunately, in the province that I work at, and through the uh, a lot of the advocacy that I'm fortunate to be part of, we've elevated the profile of genetics, at least in Ontario, and that includes for kidney cancer patients. And that similar advocacy has to happen in those other regions for that to be uh, visible uh, uh, to the um, provincial healthcare ministers in those respective provinces. So if you live in another province and you are you know, envious of the genetic care in a different province, you can uh, uh, travel to that province, seek medical care in that province, but I'm not recommending um, uh, medical tourism within within Canada at this time. I don't think it's the right thing. I mean, there's a lot of factors to bring in into that too. You know, people may sound seem encouraged, um, you know, that that might be an option. But remember, there are waiting times. And, you know, you, if you're under treatment, you know, you don't want your treatment disrupted. You know, this is a very serious question that you would need to consider. And, and I think that you would need guidance on that. So I, I'm just kind of... Um, cautioning our patient audience if this is something you're thinking of make sure you think it through carefully and talk to your medical professionals to make sure that this might be an option for you um just just a word of caution for a stage four patient that might be on treatment um it, it, if you are discovered to have a genetic um influence in in your kidney cancer does that change the treatment at all like would that Yes, I do think it changes the treatment. Um, and, and I'll take the, the, the example for uh, kidney cancer, clear cell patients who have a, a, a VHL inherited genetic mutation. Mm -hmm. You could get uh, personalized therapy with belzutifan that otherwise in a clear cell patient, they yes. wouldn't have access to that. Um, also importantly, um, in addition to the kidney cancer, we would look for other cancers in your body. Um, and that wouldn't be possible without knowing that genetic change mm -hmm. because we're able to predict the other types of cancers that you would be at risk of. Um, say, for instance, a brain tumor or you know, lung cysts or uh, an adrenal tumor or some other type of part of the body that we need to start scanning. So for the immediate kidney cancer, yes, it could. And on top of that, depending on the gene, sometimes the surgery is changed because the three centimeter rule is modified based on the projected growth of some particular aggressive inherited mm -hmm. forms of kidney cancers. For, for instance, HLRCC. Mm -hmm has a particularly aggressive form. So the imaging is done very, very frequently. And the decision to go for surgery is modified based on the gene. So I'd say for sure, genetic testing and, and the lack thereof of the of a identified genetic change is very helpful mm -hmm. for the management of a kidney cancer patient. Okay. I, I, I've got so carried away with the questions and, and the interesting topic. I, I realize that we are now over time and I do really appreciate um, for you joining us and answering these, these questions. There are a few that we were not able to get to, but we will certainly review um, now that, uh, and we'll ask Dr. Kim maybe if we I can, can say and try to, I can try to type the answers and I can say, like, I'm, I'm you don't mind. Question. Oh, that I don't mind wonderful. saying, um, Okay. It depends on the audience, and or or if you want to close it from the the, the uh, um, from your society's perspective, um, I can just try to type the answers. It's up to you. Okay. Okay. Um, that that's great. Um, I've never had this option before. <laughs> um, maybe if you just want to have a quick look, if there's something that is generalized that we could um, answer. Well, there's a question about SDHB deficient renal cancer, which was treated by radical nephrectomy two years ago. I was told not to have immunotherapy. What is your opinion? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't prescribe immunotherapy. 
However, I would say that your SDHB deficient renal cancer, you should have genetic testing to see if that H SDHB deficiency is due to an inherited genetic change mm -hmm. because that would make you at risk of developing other adrenal or endocrine type cancers. Okay. Now, in terms of immunotherapy, that is a, a more of an oncologist question. Um, okay. And uh, depending on the types of therapies that you have received and the types of genetic changes that are occurring in your tumor, then you would uh, uh, be a candidate for immunotherapy. To my knowledge, the pathway of succinate dehydrogenase and the pathway that immunotherapy is effective in, mainly the mismatch repair and other types of pathways, don't intersect. However, immunotherapy does have a lot of benefits um, that I am aware of. So, um, firstly, it doesn't surprise me that you were not recommended immunotherapy. But at the same time, this is really an oncologist question that would really need a uh, um, deep knowledge of your particular case. Um, so my, what I can say is you need genetic testing based on today's discussion and the immunotherapy necessarily could be uh, something that could be brought up. Okay. Um, uh, uh, we could, if that patient would like to reach out to us, maybe we could help or it, depending on where she's located to find a referral that might get her to someone that um, if she needed a referral to an oncologist. So, you know, to help out the situation, uh, yes. she could just write us at kidney cancer Canada and we can maybe assist um, info at kidney cancer Canada.ca and we can have a, a discussion and we'll see how we might be able to help you. Um, I do have, Maybe we can answer this question. Uh, the original, tu if it, original tumor metastatic disease is removed and there's only metastases left you know, on another organ. How do they test the original tumor or would they necessarily have to test the original tumor? So genetic testing from an inherited perspective is on the blood. Uh, okay. So it's not necessarily on the tumor. The tumor does help us at times to figure out if there is an inherited component based on the histology that the pathologist sees under the microscope, i.e. clear cell versus chromophobic versus papillary, oncocytic, etc. Um, now, in terms of the metastases uh, helping, um, mm -hmm. by and large, like I'm not a kidney cancer pathologist, but my understanding of cancer is that some of the um, features of the original cancer do propagate to the metastasis and they can subtype the metastasis based on the uh, uh, features that they see under the microscope for the metastases. However, from an inherited perspective and deciding if it's actually genetic, it's the original kidney cancer that we would like to have that information on um, but sometimes you know I would I would also caution the person who has metastases to make sure that and your oncologist will want to do this too is make sure that it's a bona fide metastasis and not a new primary another cancer that is cropping up somewhere else in the body okay um, this is a little heavier question um, regarding genome sequencing in the U.S. is about $1,000. Yeah. Um, with some cancer drugs, I'm not sure if you saw this one, with some cancer drugs costing thousands, um, what point do you see all tumors being sequenced? Yeah, or do so you see? This is the one I was trying to answer. <laughs> um, it is true the National Institutes of Health says whole genome sequencing is about $1,000. Um, US. Yes, U.S., but in, in, in even cheaper than that. And, and we're at a crossroads in genetic testing where the price is, is, is falling so quickly. Now, as I described in that picture, there are various mm -hmm. parts of the body that you can do whole genome sequencing or genetics on. The tumor, the blood, liquid biopsy, uh, other areas in the body. 
uh, cell-free DNA, etc. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, the question specifically is asking me, at what point do you see all tumors being sequenced or whole genome sequenced? Um, maybe 10 years, to be quite okay. honest. There are a lot of research efforts that are doing whole genome sequencing on tumors. I can tell you tumor DNA is very... Uh, um, it's very chaotic compared to the inherited genetic material. Okay. Uh, the other question could be is, in, in ideally, in an ideal state, you would want to do tumor genetic testing and inherited genetic testing at the same time to see what the inherited changes are versus the um, somatic or acquired genetic changes that you do see in the tumor. Um, but when you have that type of information, it really is changing how the healthcare system and oncology is working. Because even with small genetic changes, and even with even in the kidney cancer field, inherited genetic t- changes are not well integrated and recognized, and, and, and people don't know what to do with them. Can you mm-hmm. imagine doing whole genome sequencing, yeah. which, which analyzes 25,000 different genes, that yeah. may or may not be related to cancer, right? And doing that in the blood, how is that going to get rolled out from a genomic educational perspective? So these are things that the genetics community are actively working on in collaboration with the oncology community, but it is a huge undertaking and a lot of investment is in this space uh, because we need to figure out how to deliver this information in a mm-hmm. safe manner to patients. Okay. I have one more question, and it is not directly related, but you did mention liquid biopsies in your talk. And is that genetic based, that the liquid biopsies? And I, I, my understanding is liquid biopsies in Canada is not efficient at this point. But it we is. Lo- you are correct. You are okay. correct. Um, liquid biopsy is an emerging area of active research in the past three to five years, I would say, if less than that. So you can imagine, would you trust a test that has only been developed less than 10 years ago and hasn't been used on that many people? Is it going to give me the right information to make a high stakes medical treatment or intervention decision? I don't know. Most of the times it's in the confines of a clinical trial. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of liquid biopsies that you could buy off the shelf yes. in, in, in the U.S. And they're currently not the highest recommended, at least in the kidney cancer space that I am aware of. But the oncologist that's treating you would know that utility a little bit better than I. Mm-hmm. Um, except to say that, you know, I am actively interested in, in, in how this is going to be integrated, particularly for the inherited kidney cancer patients. But it's a little bit premature right now, but I do think it's going to be prime time very, very quickly. In fact, probably qu- more quickly than whole genome sequencing of all tumors and, and okay. inherited genetic material. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. I so appreciate your time and, and your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us. We truly appreciate it.